Well, good morning, everybody. You all can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks for coming out this morning. I know it's cold out there, but it's, it's clear and sunny, so it's a nice winter New Mexico morning. Um, so we're going to get right into it here. I, I'm Tony Gondola. For those of you who don't, uh, who don't know me, I'm the outreach coordinator uh, here at the museum and amongst other various jobs that I take care of. And we're going to be looking at uh, the flight of Apollo 14 this morning. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, get right into it. So when you think about Apollo 14, you have to sort of think about it in context with the entire Apollo program. Uh, of course, you had Apollo 11 in July of 1969, totally successful, uh, but they didn't land where they wanted to land. In fact, when they landed, they had no idea where they were, and it took a lot of work on the ground to finally figure it out uh, where they had actually put the vehicle down. So that's kind of a problem, because if you're going to uh, design moonwalks, right, uh, particularly in later missions where they're going to have a rover and there are certain places you want to go, you have to land in a very specific spot or your entire plan just goes out the window. So on Apollo 12, in November of 1969, uh, they were able to uh, get around that problem. The, the gravitational field around the moon is very lumpy. Okay, So as you orbit the moon, your orbit starts to change. And that will cause your landing point to change. Okay, um, So what they did is they would observe the spacecraft using Doppler radar and things like that. And they would refine its orbital position just before landing. And then while they're actually coming down, doing their descent burn, they would punch in a, a number in a specific register, which was basically fool the computer and tell it that the landing site had actually changed. And that's how they actually came down in a very, very precise spot. So Apollo 12, they were able to walk to the surveyor spacecraft and take their samples, which is a big part of what they're trying to do on that mission. And then comes Apollo 13, April 1970. Uh, not a very successful mission in some ways and a very successful mission in other ways because it's kind of a miracle that we, we brought those guys back at all. So the guys on the ground really did a fantastic job. But that set the program back about nine months. So uh, liftoff on Apollo 14 was January 31st, 1971. And the crew consisted of Edgar Mitchell, lunar, mod lunar module pilot, Alan Shepard, commander, and Stu Rusa. Um, uh, I, I marked them both. Lunar. I, Edgar, Edgar Mitchell is the lunar module pilot. Stu is the command module pilot. A little bit of a typo there. And of course, the really interesting guy to me, and we can't really talk about uh, Apollo 14 much further without talking about Alan Shepard. Um, who here knows why Alan Shepard is important? Just stick your hand in here. You probably all know this. Yeah, he was, he was in the original seven, a uh, group of original seven astronauts for the Mercury program, yeah. along with the likes of John Glenn and uh, Gus Grissom, uh, Deke Slayton. Uh, this was the original Mercury group. And he was lucky enough to fly on Freedom 7, which was the first uh, flight of the Mercury program. He was the first American in space. He wasn't the first man in space. Uh, that uh, honor goes to Yuri Gagarin. Um, but he was the first American in space. There was a lot of big differences between their two flights because Yuri actually went into orbit. Um, Freedom 7 did a suborbital hop. And so went up about 115 miles, about 300 miles downrange, took about 15 minutes. But the general public really not, it doesn't make much difference to them whether it's an orbital flight or a suborbital flight. He went into space. And so he instantly became probably the most, the most famous and the most admired man in America. Give this award, uh, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Awards to Alan B. Shepard, Jr., the NASA Distinguished Service Medal for outstanding contributions to space technology. His flight as the first United States astronaut was an outstanding contribution to the advancement of human knowledge of space technology and a demonstration of man's capabilities in suborbital space flight. Signed and sealed at Washington, D.C., this fifth day of May, 1961, James E. Webb, the administrator of NASA, and Hugh L. Dryden, the deputy administrator of NASA. This is a civilian ward for a great uh, civilian accomplishment. And therefore, I want to uh, again express my congratulations uh, to Alan Shepard. 
Uh, we're uh, very proud of him. And I speak on behalf of uh, the Vice President, who is Chairman of our Space Council and who bears great responsibilities in this field, the members of the House and Senate Space Committee who are with us today, and uh, this decoration, which has gone from the ground up here. <laughs> especially the fact that they both kind of went for it at the same time. Um, so, you know, uh, Mr. Shepard, he, he, he was America's hero and did the ticker tape parades and was on every newspaper, was on Time Magazine. Uh, he was definitely at the top of, uh, top of the game. And after his flight in 1961, they were already starting looking forward to the, uh, the Gemini program, and he was slighted to be uh, the command pilot uh, on the first uh, Gemini flight. And unfortunately, this happened. In 1963, he started noticing that he was having episodes of vertigo, dizziness. Um, he was also having a lot of strange sounds in his ear, kind of like tinnitus, but very, very loud. And for a while, he tried to ignore it and not tell the NASA doctors, but he finally came to the realization that, look, if this, if this happened you know, in space or on the way to the moon, uh, it could be a really bad thing. So he finally let the NASA doctors know that he did have a problem, was diagnosed as Meniere's disease, um, which is kind of a, not an infection, but it's, it, it affects the inner ear and it builds up fluid and pressure, causes all of these uh, kinds of uh, problems. And so he was uh, put in as the chief of the astronaut office, which he did for six years. And it's a very challenging position as chief of astronaut. Uh, you are responsible for putting together all of the training programs that all of the astronauts would have to go through to get ready for their flights. So, but really, he didn't want a desk job. He, Al was a pilot, and he wanted to fly. And especially after his taste of the first 15 minutes of orbital flight, um, he really wanted to go back. And so he had heard about a doctor, uh, Dr. William House on the West Coast, who had a procedure uh, that was effective uh, for his problem in Meniere's disease. And so with the NASA doctors okay, he went and had the operation, and they, they kind of drilled a little hole in that structure, and they put in a drain. And to relieve, to get that fluid to drain out of the inner ear, relieve the pressure, and hopefully relieve the symptoms. Uh, the operation was 100% successful, uh, and Al was ready to go. So on May 7th, 1969, after being sidelined for eight years, uh, he was placed back on full flight status, and it was originally slated to be the commander of Apollo 13, all right? Yeah, he's smiling now. He wouldn't have been smiling at that happened. Um, so, Fortunately for Al, and unfortunately for some other people, um, the people, uh, the NASA administrators felt like he just didn't really have enough time to train for the flight. That was a little bit rushed. So what they did is they switched crews. Uh, they took the Apollo 14 crew, put them on 13, and 13 they moved up to 14. And I know that for a long time after that flight, uh, it was a standing joke between Al and Jim Lovell about, you know, 13 and getting switched. And ha, ha, ha. So. But anyway, he, got, he not only got lucky to have many years uh, taken care of, but he also got very lucky to be moved uh, to Apollo 14. So, the mission. Apollo 14's destination was the same destination the Apollo 13 was, and that was the Fromaro Highlands. If you look at this picture of the moon, let me get over here real quick. Their landing site is right here. This is Apollo 14, this is Apollo 12. They're in the ocean of storms. And 14 was not on the dark material. The dark material that you see over the face of the moon are the lunar seas of the Mari. And those are basically huge lava flows that were caused by very, very large impacts uh, that just cracked the surface and allowed uh, the lava that was then plentiful below the crust to well up and flood the plains. That's the kind of surface that Apollo 12 landed on. Apollo 14 landed on what's called the lunar highlands. And all of the white material that you see on the face of the moon, that's the highland material. And that's original lunar crust that hasn't been covered with lava. So it's very old. It's as old as the moon itself. It's also really rough and battered because it's, you know, it's seen four and a half million years of, of meteor impacts. And so it's a very different terrain. And if you look out, let me point it out here. This is called the Imbrium Basin, this very large circular feature. 
and that again was the result of the impact of a very large asteroid. And it threw material out all over the face of the moon. And they felt that the area that Apollo 14 was going to land from our highlands uh, would be some of this material so they could learn more about that impact and they could also date it, which is very important. Um, the real goal for the mission, though, was to get to that crater that you see in the upper right-hand corner. That's Cone Crater. And the way it works with impacts in geology, uh, the craters are kind of very useful tools because when you have a crater impact, have that explosion, all the material is ejected out. It turns out that the material that's at the top goes the furthest. Mm -hmm. And the material that's from the bottom is right on the rim. It kind of goes straight up and straight down. So if you walk towards a crater and you periodically sample, you're going to be sampling layers that are going to be going deeper and deeper and deeper into that impact site. So that was kind of the plan. Uh, they were going to investigate Cone Crater and uh, see what that was all about. So on January 31st, 1971, this is 10 years after the Freedom 7 uh, Mercury flight. Um, so quite a long time, I think Al was one of it, probably the oldest Apollo astronaut to go to the moon. I think he was around 47 at this point. So uh, all the other guys are in their 30s. So they were ready to go. Al Shepard back in the saddle again. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, Eight, ignition sequence start. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Launch commit, liftoff. We have liftoff with Apollo 14. Three minutes past the hour. The tower is clear. Houston is controlling. Sixteen seconds, mission roll program started. 14 maneuvering to a proper flight course. So, got into orbit just fine, no problems with the Saturn. Uh, at the appropriate time, they did the translunar injection burn with the S4B third stage. Um, they went ahead and uh, separated from the third stage to perform what they called it um, to, to dock with the lunar module. Transposition and docking maneuver. So those four panels would fall away. Uh, the command service module would pull away about 100 yards or so do a 180 degree flip, and then come back, and then proceed to dock. And once we're hard docks, then springs would push the lunar module out of the third stage, and there would be an independent two vehicle setup that would go to the moon. The third stage is usually, most of them were, were uh, redirected to actually impact the lunar surface. Um, and they did that to provide known sources of energy for the seismometers that are actually already on the moon. And uh, their third stage did the same thing. So the picture on the right is, is, is an actual picture from the flight. You can see the lunar module nestled in the S4B. That cloud of material, uh, that's a non-propulsive event. The, uh, the, the pressure builds up from the fuel that's left over in the fuel tank, so you have to get rid of that or else they're, they're going to explode. But that's something that usually happens much later. Uh, well after they've extracted the lens. And there's a reason for that, which we'll get into. So, the first problem of the mission. And to understand the problem, you have to kind of understand how that whole docking mechanism works, okay? So, the cone, this bit right here, this is in the top of the lunar module. It's in the lunar module tunnel. The probe and the docking ring are attached to the command module, okay? And this probe, is able to extend and retract. And it's got this little cone-shaped device. You can see it better right in here. And during docking, you see this extends, coming very slowly. You insert that into the cone, and it goes part way in. And there are four little latches, about the size of my finger, um, that get depressed and then spring back and keep the probe from pulling back out of the cone, okay? So it gives you what would be called a, a soft dock. You can move around a little bit, uh, but you are definitely attached. Then at that point, if you start to retract the probe back towards the command module in this direction, eventually the two halves will meet, okay, where the seal is, and there are 12 latches, gas-powered latches, that slam home, and that's what gives you the, the, the firm, hard connection between the, the two vehicles or the hard dock. Well, their problem was, and there's another look at that mechanism, 
The problem was is that it wasn't working. Their first three attempts failed. They went in, did what they were supposed to do to dock, and it just kind of bounced right out. They went out a couple of feet, tried to come back in. They did that a couple of times. Uh, that's never happened in an Apollo flight before. This is really a very almost foolproof mechanism. It's designed to just work, and it wasn't working. Um, so they took a little time, and they tried a fourth attempt, and uh, some of the things that they tried was to actually come in a little bit faster than they normally did, and that didn't work. They also tried to, once they made contact, to uh, fire their thrusters to kind of hold the two spacecraft together, hoping that would uh, cause a soft dock. That didn't work. So then they kind of pulled back. And they waited a while, they thought about it, they checked through their systems, people on the ground, people in the spacecraft, looking at everything, everything looked right. They cycled through a few things, and finally, um, almost, I mean, you can see, they started at 3.13, now it's 4.57, and there's a timeline for this kind of stuff. Uh, they finally were successful on their final attempt. And uh, later, during the uh, lunar coast after the moon, they actually did remove the probe and, and, and look at it to see if that they could see any problems with it. And they, did, they really couldn't, it was operating, and they couldn't really see a problem with it. Now, this is a big deal, because if you can't, if you can't dock with the lunar module on your way to the moon, mm -hmm. your mission is, 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 is basically aborted. Um, and I'm not sure if they were on a free return trajectory. If they were, they probably would have just gone out, looped around the moon, and come back without really doing much of anything. Or they may have gone to a downloaded mission where they actually go into lunar orbit, but they don't land, and then they come back. So they, they would try to retrieve some science, but basically, you, know, you, you weren't landing on the moon, which was the main reason to, to do this. Um, there was a little bit of residual worry, because they couldn't figure out what was happening that when the lunar module returned from the lunar surface, that they might not be able to dock. And they would actually have to uh, be in their pressure suits and actually go outside and do it that way, which you could do, but it's, it's not, not a preferable situation. So it's really good that it was successful. The people were worried about it after that for quite a while. So 82 hours into the mission, Antares, which was the name for the lunar module, and Kitty Hawk, which was the uh, name for the command module, uh, successfully got into the lunar orbit, 58 miles by 168 miles, and they would later circularize that to about 60 by 60 miles, which is typical orbit uh, that all of the Apollo missions used. And they got to see all the normal sights that Apollo astronauts got to enjoy. A beautiful crescent Earth rise this time. And uh, it took about 10 orbits to get ready and for the timing to uh, start down to the surface. And now we have our second problem, which if you're into computers, is just going to knock you out. This is the Apollo computer. This is called the Disky or the Display and Keyboard Assembly. And this is how the astronauts would get their information from the computer and how they would talk to the computer. They didn't have a mouse and keyboard. They basically just had very cryptic displays and a number pad. So you, you talk to the computers in what they call nouns and verbs and inputs and outputs. So it's actually, once you learn it, it's a very, very efficient uh, system, but it's very, very foreign to us. But you got to remember back in the day, uh, you know, computers were, were big, huge things that took up a whole room. So to have something compact like this, I think it only weighed about 700 pounds, uh, that you could actually put in a spacecraft. And you had a computer in the command module, you also had a computer in the lunar module as well. So a lot of the things that the lunar module and the command module did were actually done by the computer. Um, the astronauts would, would go in and they would, they would set up a maneuver, let's say they're going to set up a burn, and put all the information in, which would be calculated on the ground and read up to them, and then the computer would start counting down, and about five seconds before doing whatever it was programmed to do, uh, it would ask you to proceed, which is basically, do you really want to do this? And once you hit the pro button, then off it, it does the maneuver. So it's kind of an, an amazing machine. Well, the problem was, as they were checking things out, getting ready to land, input channel 30, uh, which is one of the inputs from all the buttons and controls, bit number one aboard with descent stage, it kept flipping to zero randomly. And zero in this system means, yes, this, you've pressed the button. But they hadn't pressed the button. And it would come on and it would come off, and they, you know, they tried, they're looking at different things. And the best thing that they were able to come up with 
is that they felt that there was a solder ball inside the abort button switch. And this little ball of solder was floating around in zero G and every once in a while it would make contact and it would be as if the abort button had been pushed. Now when you push this abort button, when you're trying to land on the moon, it fires pyrotechnics, it separates the descent stage from the ascent stage, fires the ascent stage engine, and you're done. So that would not be a good thing to happen in the middle of the landing. So uh, Draper Labs, MIT, particularly Steve Ailes, um, who knew the software better than anyone, looked long and hard at what could they do, what could they do. And basically it came down to fooling the computer because there was no way they could stop this random input from happening, okay? But they could do things uh, to have the computer ignore it. And so their solution, think about this now, their solution was before they started the descent burn down to the surface, which to input a program that indicated to the computer that they had already aborted. And because the computer thinks they had already aborted, it wouldn't pay any attention to a, a, a signal from the switch. It, it, it's past that. So they fired the engine, they had to throttle up manually and settle everything down. And then at that point, they were able to punch in a bunch of numbers, basically reprogramming the computer on the fly, all right, to get back to their normal landing mode. Now, at this point, they've kind of cut out the abort um, system part of the program, so they would have to use the secondary computer, the abort guidance system, specifically if they needed to do an abort. Um, but it's probably the most brilliant piece of computer hackery uh, that's ever been done when you consider the amount of pressure that they were under, because there was a certain amount of time they had to get down on the ground. Um, so uh, kudos to the people on the ground and also the people on the spacecraft, because Ed Mitchell was busily reprogramming that, that computer uh, while they're headed to the surface, which is, you know, arguably the most high-stress portion of the, of the mission. This did not make it any easier, but uh, it, was, uh, it was successful.
And that one's been enhanced. They've added extra frames, so it's not so jumpy and stuff. And it's always you really appreciate it because there's craters everywhere. There are all there's big craters, little craters. There's tiny craters. Even looking at this view out the window after they've landed, you can see all those tiny little craters that are probably only a couple of inches across. And they actually go down to being microscopic in size. So when you when you're landing, you know if you're landing with a helicopter on Earth, you know how big trees are. You know how big features are. But here you just got a bunch of holes. You have no idea how big they are. And the lower you get, you're still seeing a bunch of holes. Even when you're on the surface, you're still seeing a bunch of holes. So it's uh, it, it's pretty challenging. Uh, really tip my hat to the guys who, who landed this machine. They all did a wonderful job. Al's landing, I think, was probably one of the smoothest that I've seen. Uh, but anyway, his words when stepping onto the lunar surface, it's been a long way, but we're here. And for him, it really was quite an epic journey to get to that point in his career. So. Pretty amazing feeling. All right, so now let's get into the actual surface work. So EVA 1, February 5th, 1971. Uh, time on the surface, uh, almost uh, five hours. And this was the first mission where they, uh, actually the second mission where they could handle uh, two EVAs. They're just kind of pushing the, pushing the machine a little bit further. You know, they got more confidence. They didn't have to have so much margin of oxygen and things like that. And this is the last of the H missions. They actually upgraded things after this for Apollo 15, 16, 17. Um, they were able to carry more fuel for landing. They were able to carry more equipment and scientific experiments. Most notably, the uh, the rover, the lunar rover. Um, so there was there were a lot of differences between the H missions and the J missions. And this is the last of the H missions. So they're really pushing the equipment as hard as they could. So for EVA one, of course, they're going to use, do the usual raising the flag, uh, landing area documentation, pictures of the limb, that kind of stuff. Set up the TV camera. Uh, they had a color TV camera with them for this mission. And then the really big job was to load and deploy the ALSEP, which is all the experiment packages that they were going to be leaving on the surface of the moon. And that included a passive and an active seismometer. Uh, they had a thumper device, which was kind of a, uh, kind of looked like a vacuum cleaner. In the bottom of it was a metal plate, and it had shotgun shells inside. And you could fire this thing up against the ground, and it would make a hard thump for the seismometer to pick up. And they would do this at various known places away from the seismometer to help calibrate all of that. They also had a group of uh, four mortars that they could fire off and that would impact the surface. Of course, they wouldn't do that until they were, they were well away. Uh, but it was uh, quite an interesting experiment with the active uh, seismometer. And they also had to deploy and load the uh, MET, which was the mobile equipment carrier. There's a couple of good pictures here, both on the moon and uh, from Florida on this thing. And it's, I guess, that a lot of people just called it the lunar rickshaw, because that's kind of how it was designed. Apollo 12 had a little folding stand that they carried around with them, because they had a pretty good walk out to the, the surveyor, where they could put core tubes and equipment and stuff like that. And it was OK, but they thought, because they're going to be going so far, they're going to be walking all the way up to Cone, they needed something a little bit more sophisticated. So the guys on the ground uh, came up with the MET. Um, it didn't really work that well because the surface was so bumpy and so rough and things are so light on the lunar surface because you want to build these pieces of equipment light because you can't carry that much weight. But on the moon, it's kind of like dragging a, a rickshaw that's made out of styrofoam. It would jump up and down. It would, I was always trying to tip over it. At one point, they actually just picked it up between the two of them and just walked with it that way, just, it was just easier. Um, so. 
not really a big success. And, and on the next mission, Apollo 15, of course, they had the rovers, so they didn't have to deal uh, with anything like this. But you can see in that right-hand shot just how sort of bulky and hummocky and hilly um, the terrain uh, there was. And it wasn't really flat. And uh, we'll get into that because it, it, it causes some issues. And why won't this advance the slide? Hello. Technical issues. I've never had it do this before. Like we're back in the saddle again. And it's just <laughs> okay. I'm glad somebody got that. If they can reprogram a computer on the way down to the moon, we can certainly get past this little problem. All right, okay, and of course the obligatory pictures taken with the flag and all that kind of stuff, that's Al. And uh, a couple of uh, additions to his suit, they started using the red stripes on the commander's suit, so in photographs they could tell who was who. Was who. And you also see those little visors. Um, when the sun shines directly on your visor, it's kind of like sun shining on a dirty, dirty windshield, and it just kind of blanks everything out. So the Apollo 12 crew said, you know, it would really be nice if we had these little flippy things that we could put down, so you can see that on the sound of so this is a nice addition. Okay, so EVA-1, totally successful. They got all their busy work done, got all that out of the way the next day. Uh, EVA-2, February 6, 1971. And again, time on the surface was about the same, about four and a half hours. And uh, their destination, of course, uh, was to get up to Cone Crater and do all of that sampling uh, on the way up there. So they actually, the total distance that they traveled on foot, um, three kilometers. It was about a, a one and a half kilometers to get up there and one and a half kilometers to get back down. And so that was quite, quite ambitious. And this is a big crater. And they um, were dragging the rickshaw. And they were dragging the rickshaw. It's a big crater, 330 meters across, almost 300 meters deep. So this is a very, very significant geological feature. And here's the map, actually, that they had to essentially work with. This was the best picture that we had uh, of the landing area. And that little arrow indicates uh, where the lunar module is. And so they're going to be going straight up that slope um, to Cone Crater. But if you imagine trying to use this to sort of navigate your way along, uh, there, there's a lot of craters, um, but there are no tall landmarks that are kind of going to stick up and, and help you a little bit. And it turned out that it was in a really, really incredible problem. Um, you can see uh, Edgar Mitchell on the right-hand side. He's holding that map, and he's basically trying to figure out, well, where the heck am I? And, you know, where do I need to go? And this ground was, again, very undulating, very hummocky. Craters are very, very easy to see if you see them from above. But from ground level, they kind of disappear. They have a little bit of a rise on the rim, and then if you've got a hill, and then it's behind the hill, then you can't see the little rise. And the other thing that's peculiar about the lunar surface is that walking and traveling in certain directions can be really difficult, particularly if you're going towards the sun. Because at that point, everything just sort of grays out. Everything's the same color. Going up sun and going down sun are really tough. Would okay. compass work? Um, no, because the moon doesn't have a magnetic field. So yeah, you'd have to have some kind of a gyroscope. And, and they did have a gyroscopic system on the lunar rover, but they didn't have anything compact enough that they could just carry with them. So basically, it's using a map and dead reckoning and, and saying, go that way. Um, so it, it, was really, it was really quite a deal. And here again, you can see the nature of the terrain, right? If there's something behind this hill over here, uh, you're not going to see it. And, and it took them two and a half hours to get to the point um, during this traverse um, where the ground said, look, you guys are out of time. You've taken two and a half hours to get up there. You've got to get back, you know, oxygen reserves and, and all of that stuff. And so they never actually got to the rim of Cone Crater. And, and this was a big deal for them because they really thought that would be spectacular. Of course, the, spec the photographs would have been just amazing. They would have plastered all over Life magazine, standing on the rim of this gigantic crater. Uh, and they just couldn't get there. And I know Edgar Mitchell particularly was very disappointed uh, that they weren't able to do that. But here's a little video that shows you exactly what they accomplished. That's the lunar module Antares. The red line is the traverse. 
And you can see them stopping in various places on the way up to do their sampling to get that stratigraphic record of the, of the layers in the ground. And just kind of heading up a gentle rise. And that's where they took that picture of Hegger. It was about 800 meters now out, still thoroughly confused. I mean, generally going in the right direction. That you could do. 1,200 meters. And I think that's the furthest point, 1,400 meters. And at that point, uh, they had one more stop. And they were told by the ground, that's it, guys. you got to start heading back. And this is where they actually were. They were 40, they were 40 feet from the rim of the crater, and they had no idea. Absolutely amazing. But scientifically, it was a complete success. They got the samples that they were supposed to get as they were going closer and closer to the, to the crater. And right at that point, when they were 40 feet from the crater rim, there were these very large boulders. So you know that these are large, they were white, they were very unusual looking. So this is material from the very, very bottom of that impact crater. And this is, that's exactly what the scientists, the geologists on the ground uh, wanted to see. And it, it actually allowed them to date the Imbrian Basin impact to about 4.7 billion years ago. And again, added to their timeline of lunar events. So it turns out that all of the really big impacts happened between three and a half and four and a half billion years ago. And it's been relatively quiet since. Uh, so just more information for them to work on and figure out how the solar system works. So they scientifically, it was a very successful mission. So after all of that, of course, there's one thing left to do. Uh, Al Shepard's an avid golfer, as some of you might, might know. And um, he didn't tell NASA about this, but he had a six iron that was uh, specially modified to uh, fit at the end of the uh, contingency sample pole. And it all folds up, and it's you know, very compact and stuff like that. And uh, he had a little fun on the moon. Uh, yes, and while you're looking that up, you might recognize what I have in my hand is the uh, handle for the contingency sample return. I just still happens to have a genuine six iron on the bottom of it. In my left hand, I have a little white pellet that somebody in the millions of Americans uh, drop it down. Unfortunately, the suit is so stiff, I can't do it with two hands, but I'm going to try a little sand trap shot here. Unfortunately, they didn't. Uh, they went about 40 feet. Oh. <laughs> but, you know, you had to do it one-handed in that stiff space suit. I mean, I, just to hit the ball, I think, is, is, is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. How did NASA respond to that little um, trickery going on there? Well, it didn't really endanger anything. It didn't really hurt anything. And they, they probably weren't very pleased about it, just simply because they didn't know. They didn't have much of a sense of humor. Yeah, no, no, not the event sense of humor. Um, so after 33 and a half hours uh, on Moon 2 moonwalks, the great adventure of not finding Cone Crater, collecting almost 100 pounds of lunar samples, and playing a little golf, it was time to go home. Okay, your fourth stage is set. SM engine is armed. Six, five, four, go. three, two, one. Go. 
and orbited the moon a few more times, and then did their uh, Earth transfer burn, headed back to Earth. Now, the, the, the trip back to Earth from these lunar missions is usually a pretty quiet time for the crew. They've pretty much accomplished everything that they needed to accomplish. The only thing they really had ahead of them was the re-entry and landing. So it tended to be pretty quiet. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot to do. And uh, during these uh, two and a half days, uh, Edgar Mitchell, if you know anything about Edgar Mitchell, he's a very, how can I put this politely, very open-minded, okay? Particularly when things related to ESP, the paranormal, things like that, okay? And on his trip home, uh, this is basically how he described it, uh, gazing through 240,000 miles of space towards the stars and the planet from which I'd come, suddenly experienced the universe as an intelligent, loving, harmonious. And really what he's experiencing is what we know now as kind of the overview effect, which affects almost everybody. Uh, most recently, um, Mr. Shatner, right, from his little, little hop of Blue Origin. It just affects you seeing things from that uh, perspective. But unknown to NASA, and unknown to his commander, who would not have been happy about it, and Edgar Mitchell had set up with some friends on the ground to do some ESP uh, test um, during the flight, which just would, it would have made Shepard just crazy. Um, so what he would do is that when it was time for his sleep period, he would take 15 minutes, because you're kind of alone, and you know, you're on your own then, and he would do these experiments. And uh, it turned out that it actually became public very soon after the flight returned. And, uh, but uh, NASA seemed to have taken, you know, they took it well, and uh, they really didn't get any trouble. I don't know what Al thought about it. Um, I don't, also don't know what the results of the experiments were, so that's, I'm sure there's a paper floating around out there somewhere. And successful flashdown in the ocean and retrieval. There's Edgar Mitchell emerging from the command module. And it's, it's, I always enjoy thinking about, you know, you've, you've been in this sterile environment for 14 days. Um, you, breathing pure oxygen, canned air, right? Away from anything natural. You've been to the moon. You've had all these experiences. And they're here suddenly. You open the door, and there's the ocean, the smells of the ocean. And, there were plenty of smells that were coming out of the command module as well. Um, but it just had to be just such a, a, an incredible sensory <laughs> uh, after that experience. So I often, often wonder what that really was like. And here they are on the carrier. Uh, you got Stu Russo on the left, and you've got um, you're in the middle, and there's uh, Al Shepard on the right. And you notice they're kind of getting away. They're still wearing the, the respirators. There were still people who were really worried about these germs from the moon, uh, but they weren't wearing the big, uh, what they call the bigs, the uh, bio-isolation garments that they had on Apollo 11. They just had these little masks. And uh, the whole thing was really silly because, I mean, as soon as you open the hatch to the command module, whatever bugs there might be floating around in there are released. So, but there are people who, who still thought that there might be a problem, so NASA went along with it. But I think this is the last time that they actually took any um, uh, precautions at all. They did have to isolate uh, in the trailer, and uh, this is a good place to uh, end this presentation and open it up to questions if you have any. Is that one way back there? Yes. yes. What did they do for entertainment? They're there for two weeks with a lot of downtime. Did they bring books? Um, I know that they brought, and this is true of all the crews, they had a little tape player, a little cassette player. Uh, and they could listen to music. I don't know that anybody brought books, and it was probably a weight constraint that probably wouldn't allow them to do that. It, it, there wasn't as much downtime as you might think, uh, particularly on the way out to the moon. There was more on the way back, but on the way out to the moon and while you're in lunar orbit, uh, you're pretty damn, you're pretty damn busy. The NASA makes sure that they get all of their their science objectives met. There's a lot of photography to do. There's orbit changes to make. There's a lot of checkouts of the equipment and getting ready. So they're fairly busy on the way out. Entertainment, I don't think, was 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 that much of a problem. I mean, you can look at the Earth and the Moon as you do your PTC rotation, right? Um, I mean, they keep you occupied for quite a long time. I'm sure they probably didn't have as much time as they would have, or would like to have, to do those kinds of things. Did they ever check out the crater? Did, in, in terms of? Did people get there and check out the big old crater that they missed? 
Oh, the question was, did we ever check out Cone Crater? Well, no, that's the only time we, we've landed at that site. So, uh, no. But again, you know, all they really missed was the photo op. Um, they got the samples that they were there to get, so that part of it was successful. So there really was no need to go back onward and upward. Yes? When they take photographs on the moon, the stars are not visible because they're the lunar surface is so bright. Right. But can they actually see the stars? Okay, the question was the stars don't show up in the lunar photographs because it's basically a scene in daylight, just like you don't see stars in pictures that you take during the day here on Earth. It's the same reason. Um, if on the moon, if you took a tube, right, and you just look through that tube, and you, the sun wasn't shining on the edge of it, so it was perfectly black, once your eyes adjusted, uh, you could see stars that way. Uh, and as, as fact, it, uh, through the uh, through the OTA, the little telescope that they use for uh, rendezvous and docking, and it was you placed up in the overhead window. Um, and if you looked very carefully and you kept it dark enough, you could see stars that way. Uh, as a matter of fact, they would actually point their uh, optics at stars to get various positions and stuff like that, and they did that on the lunar surface too. So with the right circumstances, and make it, if your eyes were dark adapted and you were working blinded by bright sunlight, you could see them. Good question. So it sounds like we'll probably be going back to the moon again pretty soon. Do you know any details on that? Or? Yeah, the question was, we're going back to the moon soon. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the plan. Uh, the problem is, is that there's, there's really two factors here. You've got NASA and the SLS, and you have uh, SpaceX and Starship. Uh, SpaceX and Starship was selected by NASA to actually be the lunar lander. Okay, so they're going to take care of that part of it. And SLS is the giant new rocket that they're developing uh, that's basically going to take the Orion spacecraft um, and the astronauts um, up there. So the, those two systems have to work together. But we're having a lot of delays with SLS. Uh, Orion spacecraft, they did a test flight a long time ago. It's ready to go. But the big SLS rocket I just read last night uh, the, again, there are more delays, um, so I'm not really sure when that's going to fly. Uh, it, it may fly an unmanned test, maybe by the middle of the year, but the way things are looking now, it keeps slipping back, back, back. And every day they don't fly, that's a million dollars, just to put it in perspective. Uh, so that's kind of the problem with the way NASA does business, because they're tied to these, these really juicy government contracts. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... And, and they're maybe <coughs> suffering from a little bit of risk aversion too, I'm not really sure. I think SpaceX will be ready. Whether NASA will be ready will be a, a, a different question. So if they can get their stuff together, maybe next year, maybe 2024. I'm thinking maybe 2024 is probably going to be more, more likely. Has the, the plan established kind of a base there, kind of a staging area to go to Mars? Yeah, they, well what they want to do is they want to put a lunar, what they call a lunar gateway, which is basically a small space station in a very high orbit uh, around the moon, an elliptical orbit. And so to go to the moon you would go to, the, you would go to that station first and then you would leave from there to take the lander down to the surface. Okay, so that's going to be kind of your, your, your way station. Um, the eventual plan is, yes, to establish a base at the South Pole of the Moon. And some of these craters in the South Polar regions, the bottoms of these craters never seen sunlight. Or it's been billions of years since they've seen sunlight. And they actually did a mission where they, they crashed um, a satellite into the bottom of one of these craters and then studied the ejecta that came up, and there was a lot of water. So anytime a molecule of H2O goes by one of these coal traps, it just gets stuck. And you give it enough time, and you're going to de develop quite a deposit of water. And it turns out that this is a common process uh, anywhere on the moon when you have those conditions. And so they know there's a lot of water there. And so that's why they want to put the base there. Because if you have water, you can break it down, you have oxygen. You can break it down, you have hydrogen um, for fuel. Oxygen to breathe, water to drink, you know, it's really the, the big commodity that, that makes it even possible to do this. So that's the eventual plan, is to establish the lunar base and use that as a model kind of to how to learn 
to live in that sort of environment, getting ready to go to Mars. So that's the plan. Uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Yeah, it's good. It's, I mean, there hasn't been a time since Apollo where so much has been happening in space. So it's, it's really an exciting time if, if you're a, a, a young engineer or a geologist or whatever. Uh, it's never been more possible for you to find a job uh, having to do with uh, space program, whether it's through SpaceX or through NASA or through uh, anywhere else. And this time it won't be a man on the moon, it'll be a woman on the moon and a man on the moon. So I'll be sure of that. It's exciting days ahead. So if there aren't any more questions, I think I'll turn it over to uh, Kathy Harper and she's going to fill you in with the future going on at the museum. Thank you. Mm -hmm.